invited talk in the Taming the Daily Invited Speaker Series. This talk is, uh, has been made possible uh, due to generous support by EMC, SAS, Schwab Performance Technologies, ePartners Program, and the NC State Engineering Foundation. Today's speaker is John Hayer, who is a professor, a professor in the Mathematics, Computer Science, and EC departments at Duke University. He is one of the founders of topological data analysis that he is going to describe to us today. And as he just told me, uh, when he was uh, setting it up, uh, the idea was that there will never be any practical applications. <laughs> and so right now he is, you know, he's also co-founded a small company called Geometric Data Analytics. So I guess he has found some applications of this work. So welcome to Dr. Hayer. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, that really was the thing. I mean, we were very proud of the fact that nothing we were able to do in topology would ever be useful. <laughs> in fact, that was the criteria for deciding what was good stuff. But that has, that has changed, I think. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to come over here. I come over here all the time for lots of, lots of reasons, but it's the first time I've ever spoken to folks in computer science. Can you hear me okay? It's working? Okay. Um, and it's a very, obviously, a very mixed audience. There are experts in the audience who know more about the subject than I do with people who don't. So I will try to say things in a way that will hopefully get the little content at the end, but uh, try to just introduce the topic um, to people. Topological data analysis is, uh, as for the obvious, obviously is an outgrowth of a part of mathematics called topology, which has to do with, you know, the word topo means shape. Topology is study, so it's the study of shape, and it has to do with, uh, in topology, we spend a lot of time thinking about features that remain invariant if you distort but don't tear an object. You've probably heard that. Please don't ever say anything about coffee cup and donuts. I really hate that one. It's just really stupid. Instead, what it's about is it's about, uh, it's about, about looking at scale, looking at global scale for objects and trying to understand uh, the things you can see. So don't get too fine. The level. Topological data analysis, which was born about 15 years ago uh, when Herbert Ellsritter came up with a wonderful idea called persistence, is, uh, is the study of applying the basic underlying tools of topology, but using them to understand geometry, shape, or data sets, and actually measurement. So it's not exactly topology when we talk about topological data analysis, it's sort of part way from a mathematician's point of view, between topology and geometry. But from a computer science point of view, we think of it as being a, a way of looking at data, trying to take some aspect of the shape of the data and using that to learn something about the problem we're trying to study. That's the, that's the theme. So let me uh, try to give you a bit of an introduction to, uh, to what we do when we do topological data analysis. Let's see if I talk down here, it's really loud. Okay, so uh, the idea is, sh is shape, shape and data. There's some interesting examples, right? How do I recognize what that uh, a data set that I've collected on some particular problem has certain characteristics? You know, what are the sort of local shapes that I see there? We zoom in and try to find various kinds of features here. See this protrusion that actually is something you might be interested in. That's motivated by a problem we're studying, hyperspectral images of certain chemical uh, chemical plumes. Uh, no, it's fake because there's the obvious jelly roll, but this kind of phenomenon happens there. Um, and here's an example. This is actually a picture of some LIDAR data that we studied where we're trying to understand, uh, you know, trying to, to classify certain, certain shapes and patterns in the data that's collected from, uh, from an airplane flying over somewhere in California. So this is the kind of stuff we're trying to do is what can we learn about whatever problem we're studying by capturing the intrinsic shape, which could be dimensionality, curvature, whatever, of the data that we're talking about. So now let me give you a little example uh, that I hope will illustrate the fundamental concept behind topological data analysis. And the idea is that we, whenever we're looking at a problem, we're studying data, there's always a question of scale and sort of, you know, well, let's say scale, right? There's always a problem of when have we captured the whatever it is that we're trying to understand about some particular object. So let me illustrate that with an example. So here's, here's, a, here's an object, looks like a dumbbell of some kind, right? So if we think of it as a two-dimensional object, 
And over on the right, I have a bunch of points that were sampled from that object. And the question is, if you just look at the samples, to what extent do those samples represent the original object? Can you somehow capture the shape of the original object? So since the other, since your brain retains images, you know exactly what it is and you see it. But if you hadn't, if I started with this, maybe you, have, you weren't quite sure. Is this something, is this a solid region that I've just sampled and maybe I see a slightly bigger hole there than others just because of sampling phenomenon or is there really something there? And in here, well, maybe you probably believe there's something there. How do we actually decide that the underlying object that those points somehow represent, if there is such a thing, uh, is, uh, is what it might be? So one idea is that you start at the points and you start growing little balls around them. Okay, and you grow these balls. So you look at all the points within a certain, all the points in the plane within a certain distance of our sample points. And then you notice that what happens is as you grow those balls and you sort of take the union of the stuff that they cover, you'll see various things happen. You'll, see, you'll go from having a whole bunch of points, I think there's 28 of them, uh, and you'll start to see things connect up. Notice that at this point, some of these things are connected, some of the points still are on their own like that. And you'll grow a little bit further. At some point, you'll see everything kind of connects up. And what happens is by the time you do that, you also see a kind of a hole here and a hole here. So you start to see some kind of a, some kind of a global feature emerge. Okay? This one is smaller than that one, so maybe it's less likely to be real. That's really the pretty fundamental idea. So we track things like how many components there are. That's an important feature as we grow these things. And how many sort of cycles there are. Where I mean a cycle, I mean a sort of loop inside the object that I can't fill in, right? That's the cycle. So the formal word in mathematics is we're talking about the homology of the object, but you don't have to know what that means at all. It's just we're looking for these cycles. So you see there's a, there's a big cycle there, and uh, there's also a little cycle as well. And so the question is, you know, is this a, is this a real cycle in the object? It's the other one. And how do we actually understand that? So the idea is that what you do is you don't say, well, here's the scale. Anytime you pick a threshold, you run a risk of doing something stupid, okay? We all do it because we have no choice. Don't ever do it if you can get away from it. And so what we do here is we think, okay, I'm not going to pick a particular scale. I'm not going to say, well, everything within a certain distance should be part of whatever object I'm doing. I'm going to look at all of the scales, and I'm going to look at how things change as we grow these balls and take the union, right? So at the very low, lowest scale, we have our points. As we're going along here, it's connected up, but you notice there's still a bunch of little holes. A little further they fill in, a little more, and finally that one. The interesting thing is to notice that the original shape never occurred anywhere. So if you picked a scale and said, that's the right way to represent it, represent it, you would never have found it. Because by the time we filled this hole in, the other hole's gotten really small much smaller than it really is. So what we really want to do is we want to capture features of, the, of this data set that sort of come along at some scale and see how long they live before they disappear. That's the fundamental idea behind topological data analysis, I would say. Okay? So here's how we represent that. Um, what you see here is you see a bunch of points down here. These red dots correspond, these are not the the components, they're the little, the little holes that you're seeing, the little cycles. Okay? And I've drawn these five points here. Each one of them has an x-coordinate, which tells me that that's the size, that's the scale at which I created a loop. Notice there weren't any over here. So at time zero, there's nothing. By the time I reach 1.5, there's some kind of a little loop that gets created as I'm growing the balls. And the y-coordinate is the time when that hole fills in. Okay? So these points are describing shape aspects of this filtered object, this whole collection, not just one particular scale. In particular, this point here corresponds to this cycle. And as you see, it lives all the way up to this other part where it fills in. So it sits way up here. The y-coordinate is a lot bigger than the x-coordinate, whereas these smaller ones 
live down there. So let me emphasize that again. If I look at uh, if I look at that particular cycle there, the little the loop, which is the real one from our underlying data set, and we look at uh, how long it lives, it lived all the way to the right, then that corresponds to that point right there. This is the birth time, and this is the death time, as we call it. Okay? And I say, well, look, that one is pretty far up above the diagonal. I kind of believe that one is there. That's, I have high confidence. So you know, from a sort of statistical point of view, I have, I say it's likely that, in fact, there is some kind of a hole. Here it is. You're not supposed to know what that is. There's some kind of a hole in the, in the data set there, in the object there. Whereas if I look at the smaller one, you see that was born down here and lived all the way up here. Okay. So this one, uh, you see, it corresponds to a point it was actually born a little earlier, I think. I'm, I think I've got this roughly right. It doesn't you know, exactly. And it lived only to this scale. So we get a point that's much closer to the diagonal correspond to the fact that it's smaller. And I would say I'm less confident that that's a real feature of this particular object. As you see, it wasn't. It was something to do with the sampling. And then you've got all these other ones. Uh, in fact, I think I may have missed one or two because I've seen at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven there. I only got five points. So there's a couple others that are really close to the diagonal there that came and went very quickly. So that's the uh, that's then the fundamental idea behind what's called persistence, which is the main tool in topological data analysis. Now the important thing is that this diagram of points here. And I just showed you how to interpret it, right? I'll look at these points, and I say, you know, how much do they describe something that might be real? Well, that has to do with how far they are from the diagonal. At least that's one way of interpreting this stuff. Actually, I'm going to completely invert that later, but for the moment, that's that's where we're thinking of it. Then uh, I've got those points that are in the plane. If this data set is in 150 million dimensional space, I can still, I don't have to do dimension reduction. I can still compute this diagram, and it's still in the plane. So the point is that, well, of course, you'll need more points, to, as you know, thanks to the curse of dimensionality, than this to really capture the object. But, but in any case, the dimensionality of the space can be really high, but this representation is always two-dimensional, and it captures shape features of the data that can turn out to be quite useful. And I'll try to show you how, uh, how that happens in a minute. OK. But of course, this is, you know, we're, we're, we want to compute things. So how do you compute something like that? If I really had to figure out where all these balls intersect and when these holes figure in, that could be quite intense. A priori, you know, I mean, that, that could be quite hard. There's a concept of what's called a check complex, which is a nice object that you can write down and you can program into a machine. And the idea is that you start with the original set of points, and as we grow these balls, what we're, con what we're interested in is do the balls intersect? Well, whenever they do, we'll join them by an edge. So for this particular size, I've drawn an edge. And then if the balls for three different points intersect, so they've filled in a region, then I'll fill that in with a triangle. And so what you do is you now go from this sort of, well, how do I compute that world of taking the unions of balls to something very concrete, not necessarily fast to compute the way it's described. But you can say, I've got a bunch of points, and I'll look at their pairwise distances, and then I can compute from that kind of information what's going on. I can actually write down a program to compute this, this concept of persistence. Okay. All right. Uh, right. So you'll see, for example, yeah, let me illustrate that, that this loop that I talked about ends up being this union of edges to, to, uh, to identify that edge. Okay. All right. Now, actually, I, I will just say one technical thing. What, there is a real kind of hassle if you use these check complexes, which is actually figuring out when Triples, triples of balls intersect is a real problem. So we usually pass from this to another object called the Rips complex, where what we do is whenever we've got, we go ahead and fill these red triangles in as well from what we had before. Whenever we've got two points that we connect by an edge, and we do that with three and we create the boundaries of the triangle, we go ahead and put the triangle. Similarly for tetrahedra, et cetera. So what that really is, this really is what I said. This is a complex. But you can just build just knowing how far apart pairs of points are. And then you can compute those with it. Okay, cycles and all that kind of stuff. All right, so let me give you an example of, I mean, just a couple examples then of uh, what, we, what we then can do with this sort of thing. 
So here's an example, right? So I've got some kind of a circle or something, and I, and I sample it, and this is the kind of diagram you get out of it. You find that you'll find a bunch of points down here, and these points correspond to little small situations where I will have added four edges, say, and then in, until I add the diagonal, they, they form a little loop, and then it fills in, and then that will create a point along here. So there's a lot of those. But you notice what you have is you have one point, which was born when I made all the connections to make the bigger loop, and lives to the latter. So we've used the topology, which is the connectivity of this thing as we increase the scale, to give us an actual geometric measurement in some sense of the shape, the size of that circle. Which a priori, what does it mean to talk about how, how big or what shape a set of points is without something like that? Okay, so that's the concept of persistence and uh, it underlies all the stuff that we uh, we do in the subject. Um, there's a slightly different version which I want to I want to explain because of because of I'm gonna, after I've done a couple of technical things here we're going to go to some examples. Um, we can also look at a function. So here's a function. So x2 is a function of x1, and we can define uh, persistence for that function. And what is this? Well. And I'll, another way, which is very similar to the other, is you can look at, instead of taking this scale, you can look at what are called sublevel sets. So if I take this function and I take a line, sorry, the blue line, there's nothing there. Well, I want to get up to here. There's, there's one piece of the graph. And then as I slide the graph up, when I pass this, I notice there's two pieces to the graph. And when I slide it all the way up to this pink line, there's one, two, three pieces to the graph. It's kind of like the other thing where I'm growing the balls, but a little different. When I pass this point, as I go up above this, then what happens? What happens is these two components join into a single component. So you have a W. So we now went from having one, two, three to having one, two components for the object. So we had a birth of a new component at this height, a birth here and something got reduced there. So what we do is we plot the times when, as we sweep up, the sublevel set creates a new component against the times when they're merged. So what happens here is these two different pieces get joined into a single one, and that point represents that phenomenon because what it is is it says, when I passed here, I created a component, but when I reached this level, it merged to one that had already been there before. So that's the the point there. Okay, and then as you keep going up, you pass this one, and that one will actually uh, live until you reach this piece, so that's what that point is. And that, that final point there, when we created this component, this big thing lived all the way until I passed this piece up here, at which point the left-hand side and the W merge together, so that's that. Okay, so if it sounded complicated, it's because I did a lousy job of explaining. I apologize. But the, the point is that somehow the oscillations in that function, similar to the sort of shape descriptions as we grow those balls, is coded into this diagram. And what you see is this point here corresponds to the little wiggle. And these other two points, this one, which is actually much closer to the diagonal than the big one, corresponds to this wiggle. And the big one corresponds to the big sort of general shape that if I really stepped back, this would really just look like a, a cubic curve, right? You wouldn't see the oscillations at all. So that's another example. And the, the connection is if I start with a data set and I look at, I take every point in Euclidean space and I look at its distance to the data set, what's the closest point in the data set, and look at then the stuff that's below a certain level, that's exactly the same as, the, as taking the balls of a certain radius. So these are really the same, same idea. Okay, now um, the main now the idea is that somehow we've taken you know functions and by the way the functions on the on the line here but it could be a function on 15 dimensional space where the graph is then 16 dimensional or something or it could even be a function on a manifold or something else whatever uh, we've taken functions or we've taken data sets and we've created these persistence diagrams and they're meant to represent the shape okay so. What we'd like to know is that that has some kind of meaning, which is to say, suppose I have two data, two data sets. So I have one that's a sample of a circle and another one. You might ask, how similar are 
those two persistence diagrams? Are they good descriptions in some sense of what the, uh, what the shape of the object is? Are they meaningful in any way? And to do that, we'd like to actually have a, a metric a distance between these diagrams. So we do have that, and it's fundamental here. Um, I'm not going to use it anymore. I just wanted you to know that it's here. And it's, it's essentially quite simple. If I've got a diagram, which is the pink one, and another diagram, which is the, the open circle one, then you can look at trying to match the points in one to the points in the other. And you notice that there are more points in the pink than there are in the white. So some of the points can't be matched. Well, you can, you're allowed to match those to the diagonal itself, which sort of corresponds to, think of that as a feature that is born and died at the same time. So I match it with the point there. So you consider all the ways of matching it. There's the technical definition. And you say, OK, here's the optimal matching. This is the best thing I can do. And you ask yourself, how far apart were those various points? That's the, that's the idea. So you've probably seen, uh, seen all kinds of, you've, you've seen things about graph matching in the TS all the time. The, the actual the algorithm to compute this is nasty. So we actually only approximately compute it in the real world. But it's, it's kind of a, a, a typical matching type algorithm. And so what that tells me is if I take a shape and I've described it with a persistence diagram, I have something which I can kind of measure. And in fact, fortunately, there's a very, uh, very powerful theorem that says that in fact, if I take two objects that are close by, like two data sets that are close or two functions, and I look at their diagrams, they will always be close. That's right there is the reason that this subject isn't in the trash can right now. Because in fact, it shows that this method of capturing the shape is meaningful. It's stable. If I move things a little bit, the descriptor moves just a little bit as well. And you can see an actual example here whereas you're sort of seeing these little extra features that get created here actually correspond to points that are not far from the diagonal, and that's why matching it to the diagonal is a good idea. Whereas the big essential features are pretty close. So, so persistence is, is stable. Okay, so um, let me let that be the end of the sort of technical part. Not too technical, I hope. Um, the, the thing we want to take away from this is that we're going to study data, and we're going to capture that data through this concept of persistence. And then we're going to try to see how well this persistence describes the object or tells us something meaningful about the object that, that we created, the data we collected. Okay. Now, to do this, there are a lot of things. So for a long time, we, we tried to compete with the statistician. That never worked. I mean, you know, you can't have a subject that's 10 years old and compete with another subject that's hundreds, maybe thousands of years old, whatever. When did the British create stats? I don't know, some years ago. Uh, so that's silly. But the point is, in fact, it's the integration of this method in with statistics and machine learning and things like that. That's the real uh, current, current uh, focus right now. So I want to tell you, I'm not going to tell you about the stats part. That gets pretty technical. It is possible to talk about the average persistence diagram and this kind of stuff, so we can do statistics. But instead, I want to talk, talk through some examples here about uh, how you use TDA with machine learning. Okay. So um, what I'm after is the following. Suppose I've got a bunch of different phenomena and I collect data about them. That's interesting. What did I do? I do have it plugged in. <laughs> All else fails. I'm getting again. What happened? So as soon as our guy left, it stops. That's the <laughs> usual rule, right? He's, that's the reason, I'm sure. He's been here in the past. Okay. Well, while we're waiting, uh, the idea is that um, if I start with a oh, there we go. If I start with um, some data. And I try to figure out, uh, try to figure out using TDA, what the persistence diagram tells me about the data. I can ad hoc that. I can just say, well, you know, my experience is such and such, or I can try to learn it, and I can try to learn it in uh, in whatever situation I'm studying. So here's a diagram of of that whole process, right? So we're studying some problem. We've got some raw data. As usual, we have to do some cleaning it up. 
And then we go through some form of transformation to make it so that TDA is, is, uh, can be applied to the, the shape analysis step. What that means is the data itself may not have an obvious shape in it at all, but sometimes we can take, take the data and do some interesting transformation and turn whatever it is we're trying to study into an interesting shape. And I'll show an example of that uh, as a first example. Then we do the TDA and we can extract the persistence diagrams. Persistence diagrams are weird objects. Once it points in the plane, what do they mean? Well, somehow I'd like to take that and extract features. That just means a vector, feature vector, a vector in Euclidean space. And then, okay, now I've gone from data to features. Now the whole world of machine learning or Bayesian learning, if you're a statistician, opens up. You could take different data sets and attempt to learn which features characterize the different types. You know? So here's the data on a healthy patient. Here's the data on a not so healthy patient. Let's look at those features. Do support vector machines, whatever method you want. I'm not going to talk about this. There's a whole world of that stuff. I'm going to talk about just how we get these features out of the data using this method. And so, uh, so this is, I think, the, the really exciting part of what's going on in the subject right now is that modulo the hard part, which is trying to figure out how to transform it and how to decide how to extract it. This is a machine that, I, this is a process, a pipeline, that is pretty well developed now and is starting to prove to be very useful in a number of interesting examples. And that's where I'm going to try to study uh, how that, it came back somehow as soon as you left. So he's saying that it's your laptop that went. It's my laptop. Yeah. But my laptop's plugged in and it was still on. Oh, well, now it's working. No, but it was all along. It stayed on. And it doesn't, whatever. So, uh, so let me give you a couple examples of how we go about taking data that may or may not, you know, you might think, what does this have to do with this kind of shape analysis? And turn it into something where the shape analysis is kind of meaningful. So here's, here's the first example. Um, this is something that I suggested in a really, really smart postdoc of mine, Jose Perea, worked out. Um, other people, Linda Silva and Michelle, uh, had, uh, had uh, thought about this method before, but Jose proved the really powerful theorem. It's the following. Suppose I'm looking at some kind of a time series. So this is your EKG, or maybe it's the alpha waves in your EEG, or it's something like that, right? And I want to see whether or not, I want to see patterns that repeat, or it might even be just any kind of signal, right? And I want to find patterns that repeat. But the pattern, I don't want to say anything about what it's going to be in advance. So what that means is that if I'm looking at Fourier analysis or wavelets where I have some presumption that it ought to be such and such a pattern in advance, then maybe I won't do so well. And in fact, I can give you lots of examples where those methods are completely useless where we find nice stuff here. Gene expression is a good example for periodic processes like cell cycle and circadian clocks. The idea is we take this time series, so here it is. What is the time series? It's at each of these values, I'm drawing the y coordinate. These are the time steps, time versus the value, right? So I've got a bunch of points here. Okay? And I want to take a window, which is this size. Okay? Why did I pick that size? That's Jose's theorem that that's the right one to do. And you look at all of the values in that. So I take this y value, that value, that value, that value, that, write them down, treat them as a coordinate have coordinates of a point, okay? So this is a point in some 20-dimensional space. Okay. Sounds kind of dumb. I took something you can see and I've created a, something in 20 dimensions, right? But now, I'm not going to jump. I'm now going to just slide down by one step. Okay. Slide down by one step. Do the same thing again. I'll get another point in a 20-dimensional space. And then we keep doing that sliding process, one click at a time, right? So you create a bunch of points. Now, of course, if I just took a single point and I had a perfectly repeating pattern, what you'd see is that thing came back to it. But by taking more of them, you actually kind of smooth out this process. What happens is this pattern and this pattern are very similar. They may actually be identical. No, they're not identical. But you see there's a peak. They're similar. What happens is when you look at the data cloud, you get, you get a bunch of points, and they move around in space, and they come back close to where they were in the first place. So as I slide this thing down, by the time I've gotten down here, I come back in that 20-dimensional space close to where I was. And if I've got more of these, it might go around and around multiple times. Now, two important things. I don't care what the pattern is. It still comes back. Number two, it doesn't have to come back 
exactly at the right time, so it can kind of be quasi-periodic, like an EKG. If you have a periodic EKG, you're almost dead, right? EKGs are supposed to be a little erratic. In fact, heart rate variability, which is how much they vary from being periodic, is an important health measure, right? So uh, um, I won't go into the gruesome part of that, never mind. Uh, anyway, but the, the point is that this method will find this. It doesn't care about the time at all. It just cares that the pattern repeats. And what may happen is that, you know, sometimes it takes longer. It sort of means it takes longer to go around, and sometimes it's faster. But the underlying geometric object, that circular shape, is there. So by taking this guy, transforming it into this data cloud, then computing one-dimensional persistence and looking at the diagram, this point recognizes that this pattern repeats. So there's an example of, of uh, how power, and that, it's a very powerful thing. By the way, you could take windows about this size and you'd get it as well. In fact, I think other people have, have tried this sort of idea with just trying to, to take it just for like two or three, something called a point gray plot, I think, people sometimes use, where they'll do this in two or three dimensions. What happens is you get something that jiggles around and comes back, sure, but meanwhile it crossed over itself lots of times. You don't see the nice round geometric shape that taking the window about the size of the of the, of, the, of the pattern that repeats, the full pattern. That actually gives you a nice, round, robust representation. So by going into 20-dimensional space, instead of three, you get a very robust signal. You can pull that out. So that's a great example. Um, another one, which was a graduate student of mine, Chris Traley, worked out. He's studying music. So he's looking, he's listening to some music that I have no idea what it is, because I've never heard it before. So about age difference. I couldn't get him to listen to the Rolling Stones or something else. Um, but he's taking this music and he started with some different, some different uh, sequences of music that had complicated multiple patterns inside those. And the question was, could you somehow pull those patterns out? Right? So what he did is he looked at the, he looked at the music and he said, okay, I'm going to try that sliding window. And what you find is that the size window you want you ended up in something like 125,000 dimensional space. You had really noisy mess. You didn't get the signal. It didn't really work. Okay, So you can't just do this stuff. But it, it, instead, he said, well, I'm not going to throw away what all the people who work on this subject do. I'm going to instead, instead of taking the raw values like I described before, I'm going to take values that people who study music use. So they say, okay, if I take a, a chunk of music, I'll compute the timbral texture. Okay, it's just uh, it, I'm done, you know it's some technical thing for how to do this, but the point is this is designed to to uh, to distinguish between different kinds of tones, right? And I'll look at some of these other things. There's something called the Mel frequency get, uh, get, uh, set stroll coefficient. Yeah. Anyway, so that has something to do with the way way humans actually hear things, and then the chroma features capture pitch. So he used these. So what that means is you take each window and you compute these features. Treat those as coordinates of a point. Slide the window along and see what you get. Turns out you get all kinds of really cool stuff that way. And so we call this community accepted features. The idea being that, look, the music community is used to using these things. Let's use it. Number one, they must know what they're doing. And number two, which we hope, number two, they'll understand what we're doing when we do this, right? So he did this. And so as you see, here's the raw signal. It's enormous, um, 153,000 dimensional. Okay? So instead, he did this community accepted feature version. And so again, you slide the window, and you try to see what happens. So here's what the raw signal does. And he did PCA down to the 2D, and you see it's a god awful mess. And here's what it is when you do it down, the, down to uh, the 2D for the, for the uh, community accepted feature stuff. And you found this beautiful decomposition of the of the data itself, right? You're starting to see this is the part, the bridge. He has this lovely app, by the way. You should go on this web page. So I sit there and watch it all day. Listen to the music, and you'll see it bounce around in these different parts. You'll see it going through the chorus and through the bridge and back. And so the point is that, you know, we made it visible here. But there's actually a whole lot more shape, the shape description. Yeah, 62% of the variance is here, but there's more characteristics in it. So he's been able to take this and take different parts of music and reverse engineer what various cycles are from the persistence diagram are and find various rhythms inside the music and have rhythm pop out. It's really quite, quite nice. 
Now, I'm not necessarily saying you couldn't do this with regular engineering methods. You probably could. It's just an illustration of the kind of thing we might we try to do. Um, here's another example. We actually often look at local structure in a data set, not the global thing. So if I've got a data set, you know, I want to say, what does it look like here? It kind of looks like two lines crossing over here, something like that. Uh, forget the technical thing. There's some, some way of measuring and creating a kind of a new distance function so we can do persistence. This is another example, looking for local shape inside data. We've been using this for to construct something we call geometric models that give us a nice representation of the data. Okay. Then the other thing I mentioned was once you once you've done this and you've pulled out the the persistence diagram, you might ask, okay, how do I go from a bunch of points in the plane to getting a feature vector? How would I do that? And there are a bunch of different ways. One possibility, here's an example. Uh, you might take the points and well you sort of translate this thing down by plotting the x coordinate and the distance above the diagonal to get a bunch of points. Now I take the plane and cut it into little squares and count how many points are in each square. That's a naive and not very effective means to do it, but it's an example of how you could do it. So that gives you a vector. And that vector is going to capture that, you know, this particular diagram has some stuff down here and some here, nothing up there. So we can do that. Seems kind of weird. Why would you do this? But somehow, what we're saying is that there's aspects of the shape that may be characteristic of whatever data we've collected, and they appear in different parts of this persistence diagram. And we want to kind of learn that. We're going to create a feature vector and try to learn that, that process. Here's a couple more, but I don't want to go into those. We're doing on time, by the way. We go to 2.30, is that right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So here's, here's uh, so here's an example of the kind of stuff that, that you can do with this. So this was this LIDAR example I mentioned. So we, we got access to this data set, these, these data sets. There were 20 of them. They are, you know what LIDAR is, right? It's this laser, this laser that, that reflects off of objects and up from an airplane and tells you, tells you things about distances and that sort of thing. And you can tune it. You can tune so that you're looking, for example, in this particular data set, we had 20, 10 of them were were data sets where the laser had been tuned to pick up the, the, uh, the vegetation, like the trees and the bushes and stuff. And 10 were tuned so that they would pick up the ground shape, which is still three-dimensional. And the question is, could you, without looking, reach in and grab a point and all the things nearby in that data set and say, this is one type or the other? Could you tell it just from the, the local shape? And it turned out that, in fact, we were able to do that really quite well. One way to approach that is something, a nice technique that, that um, I would recommend has nothing to do with TDA. If you ever want to look at shape and data, it's what's called multi-scale local PCA. I don't know if you know what PCA is. If you don't, I'm sure I'm going to lose you. I apologize. But PCA is about trying to find, for a, for a, if I look at a data set, it's like you're trying to find the best fit ellipsoid. So what are the direct, what's the direction of maximal variation? If I look at a point and look around it, What's the direction of maximal variation? And then orthogonal that, what's the next biggest? What's the one after that? That's what PCA is. But you can go further. You can start with a point, and you can look at it at multiple scales. And you see at the smaller scale, this thing looks nice and round. When I look at all the points in the next scale up, it starts to have an ellipse that's tilted there. And as I go all the way up, all of a sudden, the ellipse is tilted this way. So multi-scale. PCA allows you to represent your data by the sort of different directionality that you get in this way. Okay? And you can use these the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, and you can do machine learning on those, and you can try to characterize what you get. Okay? And they actually, this group of people that we worked with did this quite well, but we added something to it. We added, if you look at a situation like this one right here, you're your PCA sees that as two-dimensional. It doesn't see the two things crossing. So we added that, and we added the feature in. And it was a very nice example whereby taking, the, the, uh, um, taking these features together with the local homology could actually classify the two di types of data sets. And we did really well on that. So here's another example. Um, we're looking at tracking. So uh, you've got some kind of a sensor. In this case, we're sim this is a simulation. We're simulating a, a 
a sensor on a fixed platform. And the sensor is watching different vehicles driving around. So you're watching these things, and you're trying to track them. So it turns out, I'm sure you know, lots of companies have trackers. It's big, big industry, right? BAE, and Raytheon, all of them. They all have their own sort of tracker so that they can try to try to follow uh, follow uh, all the bad guys driving around, whatever, right? Find the find the bank robberies and drive them away. So um, what happens with these trackers is that while you're moving. When people do image, image recognition and trying to identify objects, it's a lot easier to, to identify something when it's moving than when it's sitting still. You can compare it to its background, right? The place you have trouble is when these things come together in some kind of an intersection and you get lost. You're not sure who's who. And then afterwards, you don't know what's going on. So this is an example where we have one driver who's driving, comes to the intersection and keeps going straight, and here's another. This is a real example we did using a multi-hypothesis tracker. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to say, OK, suppose the tracker loses who? Loses who's who at that particular intersection. Is there some way of using the information that you had previously to characterize the behavior of that individual so that after the fact, you can pick up which one is which? Okay. So various people have, have, uh, have done this in various ways. And one of the big problems is that the, the reality is that most of the sensors have lots of noise in them. So it can be a little hard to capture those behaviors. You might not even, for example, know whether it's a car or a truck, given the <coughs> sensors called whammy sensors, for example. And you, they can really be blurred, and you're not sure who's who. So target type may not be able to do it either. So instead, what we want to do is we want to see some kind of a driving behavior. So here's, here's one way to do that, right? You can just look at the speed profile. And the speed profile of a normal driver, remember I talked about this persistence diagram for a function? <coughs> I'm looking at the sub-level sets there. Persistence driver for a persistence profile for a normal driver might be fairly even, you know. There's some oscillations there, which are these points which are pretty far up at the high speed, but have small oscillations. And there's one point corresponding to the speed up and the slow down. Whereas a more erratic driver, you might have a different kind of diagram. Now, I'm not necessarily promising you that this is one or the other. I'm just saying maybe they're different. Okay? So what we did is we took, there's a wonderful thing. You should play with this sometime. It's a great, it's a lot of fun to play with. There's something called Simulation of Urban Mobility. It's a, uh, it's a program created by, it's the, I forget, it's the, uh, it's German. It's the, they use it for, for actual urban planning. Some, I don't know, some university created this. The simulation funded by the, the German government. And so we took this and we created a whole bunch of driving patterns. So you see the green guys? Those were one kind of driver, and the blue guys, they were another. And we get this the simulation allows you to, to change the, the driving patterns. Like you can say this guy's a tailgater, or this guy goes around turns really fast, that sort of thing. And so we generated a whole bunch of these things. And what we found was that without the topological features, that I just described, the tracker would very often lose things. There's a typical example. This is the one I was talking about before. This driver came through and kept on going. The other one went the other way. The tracker, the state-of-the-art tracker that we were using, lost that, got confused, didn't know which was which. As soon as we added the topological features to it, however, what we found was that the confusion lasted a certain amount of time, and then the behavior reemerged, and it could immediately switch back to the other. Okay. Now, why am I talking about this, besides the fact that it's kind of cool? Um, the whole point is that, I guess I don't show the diagrams here. The whole point is that it turns out that it's not the big feature, like I mentioned earlier, that turned out to be important. It turned out to be lots of stuff here, like other points down here or over here. Fast drivers have a lot of points over here, smaller ones there. So the shape characterization of this driving pattern turned out to be a very useful tool to distinguish the behaviors of the different drivers. Uh, one more I'll do. I'm going to probably finish early. I'm sure you're happy with that. Um, which is, here's, an, here's another example. This is a picture. This is a schematic, sort of a sketch of what the blood vessels look like in your brain. Okay, you can see the stem down here. These are maj major arteries in your brain. And the colors don't mean anything. Uh, 
physiological. They mean something to do. They're, they're drawn there, so it's a little easier to see what's going on in the graph. Now, it turns out that if you talk to anyone who studies this, uh, this kind of stuff, they'll tell you that uh, when you're young, your blood vessels are sort of nice and smooth. As you get older, they start to get tortuous. They start to twist like this. It's something to do, I'm not quite sure, it's something to do with the aging process that creates irregularities on the side of the vessels so that they can work. And in fact, certain diseases can be recognized in that same way. So it would be nice if one could sort of take a picture and automatically sort of pick out not all these extra features like these, but rather the individual twerking of, this, of those blood vessels. So, uh, so my, uh, my postdoc, Paul Bendich, with some other folks did exactly that. And they worked on, uh, they worked on this picture. They looked, first of all, they took the brain and they looked at height and looked at the persistent diagram there. And then they also did one other thing, which is you can sort of think of taking those blood vessels and like I talked about earlier, growing points, you want to think of growing the blood vessels as well. And sort of seeing what happens when you take the union of those, do you create cycles and that kind of stuff. And they get various di diagrams. Turn out in that case, that the features that were really interesting were ones that were sort of medium sized. And they were able to actually characterize and look at the, persist the persistence diagrams, and it turns out they all have lots of points, but there's a chunk right in the middle that can actually predict this kind of a, this kind of a so um, I think I'm going to, that's all I have in terms of slides. The, let me sum up and say that what I'm trying to illustrate is not that this is, you know, some, some uh, revolutionary um, method. What it is is more of a perspective on how to go about thinking about uh, using the shape of data itself to tell you something about the problem that you, correct, that you collected for. You know, generally people will do, people will take a data set, they'll try to say, okay, I've collected it, it's some very high dimensional thing. You know, each coordinate has to do with some measurement you're making. So I've got a, an individual, I'm measuring 20 things about them. I take a bunch of individuals, I get a bunch of points in 20 dimensional space. I can't visualize it, what do I do? They'll try to do dimension reduction, PCA, linear methods like that. Or they'll try to, there'll be nonlinear dimension reduction methods. They'll try to get it down to the point where they can see it, and that's fine. But there's no question that you truly distort a lot of the characteristics of the data when you do that. So the perspective that we bring in TDA is don't do that. Look at the shape itself and find a summary of it. And this persistence diagram is a completely different way to think about capturing what that shape is. Then use that in whatever procedure you can. And I illustrated it with, uh, with the machine learning perspective. You can also do statistics on these. You can say, what's the average? What's the, what's the, the mean or the median of all the persistence diagrams for data I've collected? Like, for example, one, one thing we did is we studied plant roots. So we take these plants, and we were growing them in these transparent media. You can see the plants. Take these photographs. We did 3D reconstructions of those. And then we computed this, did this growing phenomenon like we like we have here, look at the persistence diagrams, and we're able to tell, yeah, that's one rice variety, that's another rice variety. You can see they had different shapes. You know, and ultimately, the goal of that project, which we never did, was to, was because my friend who was doing this sold his company to Monsanto for some huge amount of money instead, and never got to finish. Um, but the, the whole idea was that, was that we wanted to take this, that we could take this and we could characterize not only the rice variety, but we could also say, what happens if we start doing some kind of modification? Can we actually make, can we make rice plants that would grow with less water? That kind of stuff. That was the goal. But the whole point is that, you know, we, whatever the shape characteristic it was, we didn't have some preconceived idea of, of what that was. We just took these, took these diagrams, did the learning, and we were able to classify the different types. And I think I will uh, leave it at that. Is there anything else? No. I'll just... This is my group. Al Bendich is the number one guy. As you see, it's I've got too many people in my group. I have 10 postdocs right now. It's kind of crazy. But, but uh, those are all the projects. Okay. Thank you, John.
more about this. Um, so there's a very extensive literature that's fairly technical, sort of in the math community. Um, Herbert Edelbrun and I wrote a book called Computational Topology, which was meant to introduce persistent homology to computer scientists. He's a computer scientist, I'm a mathematician. It's very out of date at this point, um, which is the short point. He wishes we'd update it, and I don't have the time. But, uh, but that's one place to look. It's called, you know, there's a computational topology. There are some nice survey articles by Gunnar Carlson, who's at Stanford in the math department, and Rob Greist, who's at Penn. They have very nice sort of general survey arguments. And then there are a bunch of, of articles that get successively more difficult. So for those, you should drop me an email, and I'll give you more definite reference. After you create those uh, persistent topology, you have to I'm sorry, which, which machine? Similar to based machine learning methods of future based machine learning. Yeah, I mean, we've actually, we've tried, uh, we've tried creating the diagrams and then then extracting features out of them. The, the, to use the diagrams directly themselves uh, is a little subtle because that metric that I told you about, you've got this diagonal thing and that's very fundamental. Certain features, uh, they, they have kind of an odd, it's an odd space. The space of persistent diagrams is very weird. Got a lot of bad properties. So that's why we extract feature vectors out of them, and then we use a lot of different machine learning methods. But I don't know. It's an interesting thing. I mean, I have to say, of all the things we've done, we've really never done better than using fairly straightforward things like k-means as a method of classifying, for example. Some of the more sophisticated things have not really helped us much. But that's just maybe because we're not smart enough. I mean, my point of view is once I get it to the features, then I call all of you to help me how to do the rest. Um, can you um, an example of something that it would be persistence diagrams are really bad for? Like they make two really different things look the same. Oh, yes, sure. Um, I mean, if I think about the, if I, if I think about this idea of, of just using not the local but the global, one-dimensional persistence. I mean, there's all kinds of nasty things that have no one-dimensional homology in any nice way. Take a sphere and a torus and sample them fairly. Well, not a torus. It's not good. Take a, take a sphere and another and two spheres joined at a point, for example, and sample those. Was that your data set? You won't see any difference with the one-dimensional persistence. You would with two, but the problem is it gets harder to compute that. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's very very much has to be tailored. That's why I was making that point about taking something like a signal and turning it into something where the feature would, would be meaningful. You sort of have that intuition, but you can reinterpret it back in terms of what you had. And, uh, while you were talking, I was trying to look up the website, and I wasn't finding it. He's in electrical engineering at Duke. Yeah, Guillermo Sapiro and I are his co-advisors. He works with both of us. He's, he's an electrical engineer. He's a grad student, so uh, what that means is, unlike me, his website changes about every five minutes. He's like constantly <laughs> doing stuff. Isn't that the way it is for all grad students? You update your web page every couple hours. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Um, so these transformers that you're talking about, so you have your data raw data or clean data, and then you want to make it more kind of immutable to the Right. So you mentioned one was this uh, delay reconstruction, mm -hmm. or um, some of the people do like uh, density thresholding or something. Density thresholding is another very good one, yeah. Do you yeah. have any other thoughts about good transformers that help? You know, I mean, it depends on what you're after. For example, one thing you can do is you can, um, you can look at a point, and you can, um, like this, there's a guy named Mike Salpukas who works at Raytheon who defined a concept of what he called bullseye persistence, mm -hmm. where what you do is you take the point and you look at you look at rings going out of it of a certain size and look at the points in each of those, and you compute the persistence of those, um, and that particular uh, that particular feature can those those features can be enhanced by starting with PCA, you do local PCA and then adjust your scale according to the size so that the eigenvectors are all equal size. That'll take something that's not too bent and turn it into something that's very bent, and it'll show up in a, 
one-dimensional persistence diagram. Is that what you want or not? It may be a bad thing, right? You have to, you know, anytime you tinker with something, you never know. But the idea of transform, uh, this isn't new to us, right? What does a statistician do if they want to use a linear method and separate all the points, points sampled near a circle and points sampled near the origin? You can't separate those two by a line, but if you add distance from the origin as a third coordinate, all of a sudden, there it is up on a paraboloid and there's a plane that separates them, right? So the idea that somehow with some magic, and that's definitely magic, you take something where you can't necessarily use your method and transform it, and all of a sudden it works. It's not, not original thoughts. Right? But those are some examples. Density is a great one, though. Because, like, take a, take a circle and sample near the circle, you're going to pick a point in the middle, probably, and that destroys the persistence. But if you do density, you're going to see, you're going to remove that. You're only going to have the denser parts, and then you'll see it. Follow? Well, I was just curious, what's applications are Oh, that's the tracking stuff. But I've also actually, um, so I've worked with, worked with them on the tracking. We're doing a lot of tracking. We're doing, uh, uh, we're doing vehicle tracking on the ground. We're doing aerial vehicle tracking. We're tracking. We're also doing some stuff with what's called CEC data, which is, has to do with naval locations of naval. So, how do I calculate the likelihood that a particular ship is going to a particular port? This kind of thing. Um, and we're also doing a cyber project where we're using. We're using data where we take, um, so you look at something like IP, you look at something like, like packet, packet traffic. So I take 14 or 15 different types of, of things like TCP or whatever you want and take a small time window and collect how many you have, treat those as the coordinates of a point, take that data set, try to use TDA or whatever method, some geometric method to recognize when that traffic is normal and when it's not, that kind of thing. Actually, that's something that Koifman, I don't know if you know, the name Koifman is an applied mathematician. He, he did exactly that same project using a concept of what's called diffusion geometry. It was really, really successful. His stuff is being used by the Israeli government now. So the whole point is it's the, it's the, actual, uh, um, the actual geometry of that, of that internet traffic tells you, identifies for you, without knowing much in advance what's normal and what's not. Of course, then you've got to go investigate it. And he can't help you with that. Look at that. But that's the idea. So that's the APL. ACS is the company I mentioned uh, with, the, uh, with the persistent local homology. Is NIH funding? Uh, yeah, the, so we use the, we use the, actually no, not right now. We, we have a biology project called Biochronicity, where we study biological clocks, try to find the gene regulatory networks that control periodic processes like circadian, which, believe it or not, despite the fact that there's this huge subject called chronobiology, the biologists still don't know the networks that control the circadian clocks and cell cycle and ones like that. And then we use this sliding window thing that I mentioned of Jose's to identify periodic genes, and we use that as part of our effort to build the networks. Um, that came out of some NIH funding, but it's not directly funded. That's actually funded by DARPA. Uh, so do, do you think the persistent score can be a, a good metric for um, mutual similarity between different data sets? Um, so you can take two data sets, compute persistence, and look at the Wasserstein distance between them and define that. The extent to which that is a, you might call sufficient statistic, is very problematic. Sometimes it might be. There's some very nice work done by Shan Mukherjee, who's in stats at, at, uh, at Duke, um, with Kate Turner, who's, who's a graduate student at Chicago, where they, they looked at, at objects in three-dimensional space, surfaces, and they said, okay, what I'm going to do is take that surface and I'm going to look at, look at all possible directions through the surface. Each one of those, think of, think of that as sweep, sweep planes and think of that like that's a height function and you can compute persistence and compute a persistence diagram. So they get a persistence diagram for every direction and it turns out that completely characterizes the, the object, the shape of the surface. So that's an, that's an extreme example, but that's a lot of information, a lot more than you want to compute, right? So I think of it more as a sort of a summary, 
it's not going to be sufficient, but it can actually, do, but it, you know, but it can distinguish things, right? And that's the point. So, so you use it for classification. Okay, so, uh, is that method can be extended to high-dimensional data? To what? I'm sorry. Uh, high-dimensional data. Set. Yeah. Well, it depends on what you mean by high, right? I mean, there's always so, different people have different, you know, big data. What does that even mean? Different people have different definitions. Um, so. One of the problems with a method like this is, is how long does it take to compute, right? I didn't go into that. Okay. So it turns out that if you want to, the, the sort of higher dimensional homology you use, now I'm being, forgive me for using the technical word, in other words, am I looking for components? Am I looking for cycles? Am I looking for voids? The higher I go, the more complex it is. Okay. And the higher dimensionality of the space, well, it's not really, that's not really the problem beyond computing pairwise distances of points, mm -hmm. which is the sort of nearest Kate Kiernier's neighbor approximation thing you could use. What is in, important is the intrinsic dimension of the data set. If I've got something that looks like it's intrinsically three-dimensional in 85-dimensional space, it has a lot of the characteristics of being three-dimensional from the computational side. But it still can be, you know, it can still be a limiting factor. So there's been a lot of work on that recently. There's a really, really beautiful piece of work done by a guy named Don Sheehy where he, he f used, there's a theory uh, of what are called cover trees. I you've ever heard of that before. Cover tree is a way of taking a data set and giving a multi-scale representation where sort of at the highest scale, a single point represents the whole data. But at a lower scale, you choose more and more points with the properties that they have, that they have re balls around them that cover the whole data set. You get this sort of tree that represents the data set. And based on that tree, you can, can, you can do approximate computations of persistence that are, that are linear in the number of points. So you can really compute things very quickly. So we, we're getting better at it, but you know, it's only got its certain role. I mean, if you're, if you're talking about real big data where you've got to deal with Hadoop, forget it. You can't help it. It's not what we do. Thank you, Dr. Kerr.